So as our panelists are getting to brief this panel <laughs> is Julie Grimes. She suffered disabling fatigue, muscle weakness, and respiratory insufficiency due to a chest wall weakness that occurred uh, that, that two years ago progressed to a respiratory failure requiring assisted ventilation. So with the care and guidance of her palliative care team, she chose tracheotomy quality of life. It's not stopping the progression of her illness, it's purely palliative. She's a writer, an accomplished knitter, an ardent read a reader of literature and film, and a fine chef. She has a full life. Uh, and um, to my far left, your far right, is our kind of moderator, uh, Jeff Yi, who is a bird certified physician in internal medicine and hospice and palliative care. He's practiced in Woodland, California for 28 years, focusing on building community programs of care and aligning these with the medical community. Many of you know Jeff. Um, you can see he was one of our leadership award winners and got his personal signature hat along with the award. Jeff has been one of our founding leaders and physicians in the palliative care movement here in California. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. So I also want to acknowledge Melissa Miebert, who is uh, Julie's nurse from Snow Line Supportive Care. And we'll get to um, really meeting those two women, who's really the focus of this session in just a few minutes. But after Judy gave us that grand background, I felt oh, I got to give you guys some local history now. So this accoutrement is courtesy of Catherine McGregor. So in the early days of the coalition, we we're really heavily focused on initiating and disseminating polls. And so you couldn't come to a meeting without being decked out in pink. If you weren't in pink, you weren't allowed in. So we still see some remnants of that here. We still see a few people with that. So there's a couple of things that you should know about this now in perspective. One, if someone in pink polls tells you that they're really young and new to this, don't believe them. They've been around. Second, we know our work is, even though we haven't talked much about Pulse now, we know our work is not done. Our work will be done when you go to Kinko's. Instead of ordering ultra pink, you order post pink. So we know our work is not done quite yet. OK, so with that, um, we want to get into the meat of our session. So we want to accomplish a few things um, in this session. First was, of course, to give you, hopefully, a sense of renewal and affirmation for everything that all of you are doing, because that is really, really uh, important to come here and to uh, feel that. Second, we're going to want to give you some insights into really a great home-based palliative care program that I encountered through my year at Snowline Supportive Care. Um, the third thing, though, too, was I wanted to then say, OK, so but how do we get there? So I need to update this slide for resources. I need to put Katie Butler up on top, but um, because I didn't know a, uh, because I didn't have time to add that in. We wanted you to have some resources that we think might be helpful. So these are resources that happen both on a national level and a local level here to show that this work is moving forward. So there is, and you'll see hopefully through our presentation, a little bit of the facets of these tools that we use, the Serious Illness Conversation Guide, which is led by Susan Block. Um, a new resource that's coming up is Patient Priorities Care, led by Mary Tonetti. And then locally, I want to show you some of the things about choices in caring. And really, these are tools that help us lead towards patient-centered care, patient-centered thinking, which is really 
the basis of great palliative care. So, and many of you may be already doing this, maybe using tools like this similar, but this is also an opportunity for you to mentor those around you, either new colleagues, young colleagues, or those who are non-palliative care uh, people, and teaching them what's the basis for good uh, person-centered care. All right, so my job now is going to be to encourage Julie to really tell you that story. So I think you know, one of the things that we have to do is to make Julie feel welcome. So when we introduce Julie and Melissa, what I'd really like you to give her is like your most hearty, well, hearty hello. So like when I introduce myself as Jeff Yi, and I say to the audience, hello everyone, you'll respond back in your most hearty voice, hi Jeff, okay? So, hello everyone. Okay, Julie, do you want to say hello to everyone? Hello, everyone. Hi, Julie. Great. Do you feel more welcome and at ease now? I do. <laughs> Much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll get... She, Come on. She, she's not you last. Okay, it. Melissa, say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi, Melissa. And while we're at it, you know, well, in just a moment. So, many of us early in our lives are thinking, you know what, we are looking for that lifelong companion, that inseparable companion. Well, Julie has found more than one inseparable companion. <laughs> Lou, do you want to stand up and introduce yourself? <laughs> but Julie, why don't you tell us a little bit about your other inseparable companion, we won't ask you about, you know, the benefits and the faults of inseparable companion number one, ah, but I maybe see. you could tell us a little bit about inseparable companion number two, which we see up here. Um, well, that is my ventilator. My friends have named him Wally, after the little robot in the movie. Um, I prefer the name Wilma. I think it's a girl. Not sure. Um, and it goes with me everywhere. I'm never without it. It has made my life better in some ways. I can breathe more easily. I have energy. I have a voice for the first time in 15 years. Um, I can participate more fully in my life. I was pretty sick, um, kind of moving to the hospice thing. And then um, Melissa here got the bright idea about getting me trached and ventilated. Um, and that was going to be a no for me. I, it had come up before, and I had said no, because it had been presented to me as something really onerous, not only to me as a patient and my family, but to society and the healthcare system. It would be a huge medical burden. Um, and I didn't want to participate in that. But um, Melissa found a way to convince me to investigate, and here I am, me, Wally, a uh, so portable suction machine, and emergency go bag. They go everywhere I go. So really, we'll get into that story of transformation in a little bit more detail. Um, I asked you about how life was before you became ill, and you sent me some pictures. Do you want to tell us a little bit about... Uh, did you I know? send you pictures? Oh, dear. Oh, that's me and Lou um, when we were very young. We used to like to travel a lot, go to San Francisco, and that's the Japanese tea garden. We were taking photographs. I was taking uh, photography classes at the time. And um, we used to hike, go to museums. I was a runner, an avid um, cyclist, endurance athlete. Um, and we were just hamming it up, being goofy. A little Charlie Chaplin in there somewhere. Um, and we used to go to the beach. I liked, we would beach comb, hang out. Um, I was collecting shells and, again, hamming it up. I'm a terrible ham. <laughs> oh, that is me. Um, I, was, it was, I was sick then, but not as sick as I am now. And that's my niece, Zoe. And I had scooped her up and was giving her some snuggles. And she was very happy. I can't do that anymore. 
grab her. But of course, she's six feet tall and has 20 pounds on me now, so. Zoe's pretty important in your life. Is she or what? Uh, yes, she's very. more than just a niece, I think, from what you told me. Oh, are you thinking Sierra? Oh, okay, another okay. one. Okay. I have a ton of nieces and nephews and a goddaughter, and we're, Lou and I are helping to shepherd them into adulthood with some grace. Maybe a tiny bit of grit. We're not sure. Okay. And this one? Oh, I, I like to cook. Um, and I like food. I'm something of a foodie. And in that photo, I am making a birthday dinner for Lou. I'm sure it was some pasta affair, his favorite Italian. But I can't remember the dish right now. Um, and I was part of a writing group at Sutter Hospital. It was called LAMP. Um, literature and arts in, me in the in medicine program was um, and we would meet once a week and um, write and I started writing poetry as part of this and we had a we published a book and this was the book launch party with um, Lawrence Spann who was the head of the thing and um, John Crandall who um, was his sort of second hand right-hand man. So um, one of the things that I think is really important, and I'm glad you were able to share these photos with us, because it says something about you. So one of the things that we try to do in our work locally is using this tool called Choices uh, in Caring, and you have that in, in, in your package there. But one of the questions we ask the people to start thinking about and tell us about if we ask someone who knows you well, Julie, at that time, what would they say that made you a special person? What made you you um, when we're looking at these pictures? That's a really, you're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> um, well, people used to describe me as very hardworking and embarrassingly earnest. Um, uh, compassion is a word that comes up a lot when people describe me. Um, I'm a fierce advocate for others. I've helped take care of um, ill people in my family um, and advocated for them getting the best health care they could get and good deaths too. Um, and, and some would say that I'm sort of a bossy school marm and they would not be wrong and they know who they are. <laughs> So now we kind of have a little bit um, better picture of what's important to you as you're reflecting back on that time. So here's our little audience participation bit. <laughs> if you have ever had a colonoscopy, can you please stand? Mm. All right. Now. If your colonoscopy experience was so tremendous that that was like the pinnacle of the year and that you really just feel like you want to share it with, with, with your neighbors and say, you know what, you got to go to Sutter or Kaiser or wherever to have your colonoscopy, stay standing if you had that kind of experience. Oh, no one? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> Melissa, so people have, they, they obviously don't do colon colonoscopies for the tremendous experience. So, why would you put up with doing a colonoscopy? What do you put yourself through? And why, do you, why should you do that? Why should you put yourself through, you know, the discomfort and the inconvenience and the little bit indignity of having a colonoscopy? <laughs> um, I would think for the out to find out the answers that the doctor would give you after the colonoscopy. And um, we talk to patients all the time about tests that they want to go through, um, more scans, more labs. And um, the question I always ask is why? And why do you want to have this testing? And it's always because I want to know. And then the next question is, well, what are we going to do with that information going forward? 
So I think you're exactly right. So no one does a colonoscopy, no one does heart surgery, no one stays in the ICU on a ventilator just for the experience. I think Julie would have tested it. <laughs> you do it, why? Because you hope that that's gonna help you be, be better so that you could do more of the important things. So I think that's really an important thing, but that isn't what we necessarily see in palliative care, is it? It's just what happens more in the palliative care population that we see, Melissa? What do you think? Most often in palliative care, most of my patients are on a road towards hospice. And, um, and so when we're working with them and, we're, and they're going through these tests, we're supporting them during the journey, whatever, you know, offering education and um, along the journey so that they're not doing tons of um, unnecessary testing, but also kind of meeting them where they're at and um, offering them the education, allowing them to go through the testing that they want to go through. Um, but inevitably, the conversation tends to switch to a conversation about hospice because the options after the testing are not what they had hoped. So this is a picture of the Snowline Supportive Care Team. Can you tell us a little bit about, about Snowline, um, its philosophy, where it's come from, and, and uh, tell us a little bit about Snowline. Big question. So Snowline, wonderful. I've been with them for about five years. I've been working in hospice and palliative care for about eight. Um, Snowline is a nonprofit that's been around for about 40 years. Um, actually, exactly 40 years. It's our anniversary year. We're having a celebration, and you're all invited. You can ask those people back there. Um, and um, so Snowline is, again, a nonprofit, and um, hospice was around in El Dorado County, and then more recently Sacramento and Placer County. Um, and we branched down into Sacramento, and then a few years ago, and all along while we've been taking care of our patients, um, there's, we recognize, just like all of you do, the gap between healthy and hospice. And, and in that gap, we saw a need. We were talking to our hospice patients over and over again about the paths that they had gone through to get to hospice and navigating the system on their own. I have personal experience. I lost my husband and my father last year. And going through it by myself, or not by myself, I had a team. Um, and I was fortunate because with all of my experience and all of my knowledge, I still needed help talking to them about a pulse or talking to them about options for care. So the patients that we take care of um, don't know what I knew. And, they, and so there is a huge need. Um, our palliative care program is non-funded. Um, we're lucky we have a robust retail business um, we have um, our retail stores, our thrift stores, and that helps support our uh, palliative care program. And um, we, we focus on the three C's, the cardiac diagnoses, the COPD, and the cancer. And once in a while, we get lucky enough to have an, an extra, like Julie. <laughs> um, I am so grateful that I got to meet her and take care of her. So, um, so yeah, that's... So no for all of you who want to go to their free anniversary celebration, would the Snowline people just stand up for just a moment? So that uh, what I want is that for you guys to be able to talk with them at lunchtime and at the break. They really do have a superb program, and you could gain a lot of insight from talking with that team back there. Our program, we have, um, within our program, we have doctors, nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, spiritual care providers, and home health aides. And we provide 24-7 care for our patients. So um, they can call at any time and reach a nurse for advice or even for a visit. So let's get back to your story, Julie. So your story really started, I understand, when you got really sick with toxic shock syndrome in 1990. Yeah. And you survived, and you were supposed to get better, but what how did that really work itself out? What happened, really? Well, um, I didn't get better. I developed new symptoms of um, uh, joint muscle pain, fatigue, weakness, 
um, which progressed to some neurological symptoms and respiratory insufficiency. Um, and then in 2017, I, that was when I, I was diagnosed with a respiratory failure and um, was on 24-7 BiPAP therapy. Um, and it was soon thereafter that my um, GP, Dr. Price, referred me to Snowline. So what was happening with standard medical care? How were you, were you getting the treatment that you felt you deserved at that time as you were getting progressive symptoms? No. No. What was happening? Um, well, my diagnosis is not obvious, and it um, confounded a lot of doctors, some of whom were wonderfully supportive and caring, and some of whom were really awful and mean, um, demeaned me. Um, and so I had lost trust in the medical system. I'd pretty much given up by the time Snowline came on board, I think. I was just tired of fighting for care and um, it being treated so poorly and not getting any treatment, you know, going and then everyone being like, huh, that's an interesting diagnosis, don't know what to do for you. Um, so I just sort of cut back on all of it and um, I decided that I just wasn't gonna participate anymore. So you're, you actually then had to switch your primary care physician. I think. Oh yeah. And so that suddenly happens and the first thing that comes out of his mouth is. Yeah, the very care. first time I met Chris Price. Um, he took like one look at me and he said, you need services. And I was like, what? <laughs> no one's ever said that to me before. Um, and he, he talked about Snowline. And my first response was, I'm not that sick, am I? Because I thought it was hospice. And I've, I've shepherded my, both um, my husband's father, who had Alzheimer's disease, and my brother, who had colon cancer. Um, through hospice and the dying process. So I thought it hadn't occurred to me that I might be in that state or close to it. And he didn't sell it to me that way. He said it was about supporting people with um, a serious chronic illness and their families. Um, I still wasn't convinced, so I, I went away for two weeks <laughs> to think it over. Um, and. It, and I looked on the website for Snowline and got some information about that. And I thought, well, yeah, it's worth a try, and I can opt out if I don't like it. So, so Melissa, do you, so here's Julie who comes along. She's kind of fed up with the system. She's more or less thinking she's going to die. And we get this referral. What's, what did um, our first care plans look like? What were your first impressions as, as you met Julie at this stage? It's funny listening to her talk right now. I remembered our first visit. <laughs> Julie was not super happy. I was coming over and um, she just, you know, I heard everything that you just heard, maybe in stereo a little bit more and um, just pretty much dismissive and like, you can't really do anything for me. Um, her first care plans were basic. They were like, you start anyone off with a respiratory diagnosis. Um, and she had some pain and she has a little bit of um, some mobility problems. And um, so they were very basic care plans. Um, I didn't know her. Um, they changed drastically as I got to know her. So at that stage, if I had asked you that question, what would you say makes Julie special at that stage? What would, what would you have said? At that stage? Yeah. Grumpy. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, you know, I don't know. At that stage, all of our patients are special. Um, I was hopeful for her, but I was still, honestly, I don't have a lot of experience with trachs in the home or with um, BiPAPs. I have more, but um, it was a learning experience for me too. And of course, as medical professionals, I didn't let her know how little I knew. I just started researching. Um, <laughs> Yes. And, um, and I just listened. I listened to what Julie's goals were for her future. And Julie's goals were different then than they were even within a month because her goals at first were just to kind of manage things as they were and, um, 
and experience the decline with uh, as few symptoms as possible. And so that's where I was at that point. I was thinking, how do we manage her respiratory systems and what will an emergency look like? And what can we get into her home to help to keep her out of the hospital? So pretty typical for a lot of our palliative care patients that we're thinking are headed towards hospice and dying in a pretty short period of time. Julie, what was different about palliative care were you seeing? Um, well, um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is getting dry. Um, well, it, everybody was focused on me and my family. It was really inclusive. Um, no one had ever asked me what my goals for life are or um, quality of life issues or asked me to describe or define them. Um, so that was a really interesting process uh, that I got to go through with Melissa and you and Kate um, so, and Cynthia. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, and so what happened was I got to define all those things, have conversations with my family that I would not have been able to have if they had not been there to shepherd me through that because I didn't have the language to talk to my family. And they're tough. People. They're tough cookies. They, um, they fiercely wanted me to, to choose the living and a trach. And I was, so we had a lot of discussions about that. And, um, and the treatment decisions made on my behalf were deeply informed by how I live with my illness. And that made a huge difference, a huge difference in my experience. So I think actually, as, as I was part of that team at that time, we tried to bring focus and conversation to a series of questions which we take basis from the serious illness conversation guide, again, which you provided for you. And these, I think, were sort of the key questions. And um, if you can think about and reflect a little bit, Julie, what were your biggest fears and worries about the future with your health and with life? If your health situation worsens, what would be your most important goals? And what abilities were so critical to your life that you couldn't imagine living without them? Um, well, my biggest fears were being a burden to my family um, and helping my family come to terms with my dying so that we could experience that um, as a somewhat positive thing. And I could help them through that transition um, as well, and um, I wanted to make sure that my wishes about how I was going to die and what was going to happen after that were well defined so that there was no guessing was going to go on around any of that. Um, I didn't want my family to have any conflict or worries about that, um, and I didn't want to have any unfinished business either in terms of just, you know, financial things and, you know, and, but it also emotional I wanted to have all the emotional issues with my friends and family, um, some resolution um, in all of that. So a cardinal rule, and I'm one to break rules, so forgive me, is not to make your patients' decisions for them, but to guide them a little bit. So I think I remember one thing that you told us so passionately was your niece, Sarah, is that? Uh, Sierra. Sierra that she was in the midst of grad school, and what did you think of her writing? And oh, like, she's a terrible going? writer. It's just god-awful. Um, and, I, and I still have not accomplished that. She's graduating from, um, uh, she's, uh, she's gradu graduating um, uh, the School of Psychology, yeah. She's gonna be a school psychologist um, in May. She got through it. That was my big thing. I wanted her to get through graduate school and agree to get a PhD. I'm close. I'm so close. <laughs> um, the writing thing, it's hopeless. She's just not going to do it. She's just hardwired not to do that. So, and I really think, you know, we kind of saw that. And I think that's what we were encouraging was, was that, you know, despite being in a wheelchair and a trick now, do you still have a role in, in Sierra's life? I do. Um, she, uh, she's she's going to start writing her thesis in the summer, 
and she has a, um, a project that she's going to be doing, and Lou and I are going to be helping her through that process. Um, Alusa, an English teacher and, a, um, and um, a cultural studies teacher at a community college, and um, they do uh, research together, and I do a lot of editing and making sure that her sentences make sense. <laughs> So, so I, I'm very much looking forward to that. And I think that what that kind of helped us see was that if you go to the ologist that Katie was talking about, they're going to talk about how the disease responds. And what we were more interested in was how this person was going to respond and what would be. I can still do things. I'm more limited in some ways. Um, and the, but you know, the care and feeding of a trike event is super intense. It's constant. There are constant problems to solve. The supplies and the cleaning and uh, the managing doctors and um, clinics and DME companies and um, infection, you know, it goes on and on. It's more than a full-time job. Just I'm hoping that I will be able to find a way to deal with the trike in the vent so that it doesn't take up all right now I don't have any all those fun things that I got the trike for that was a turning point so we'll see so here's my advice. Go on a speaking tour, and then you can go to all these neat cities. <laughs> there you go. So a whole new career. I, we had a conversation, and I asked you, um, and I asked Lou, I said, OK, so what part of you is you know, joyful, glad that you made this decision, and what part of you was um, regretful about that? And I had a number in my mind, and Lou gave a number, and I thought, oh, that's about where I'm at. And then you came around with a different number. Oh, it was shocking, I know. <laughs> well, and that's okay. Maybe that was a bit not the greatest day. Yeah, it was bad. But it said something to me as a palliative care, part of the palliative care team, and I don't know if you felt this way, Melissa, was, whoa, here is, we've been working with this patient for 10 months. We thought we know what's going on. And we're missing something. We missed something because, we, because that was an unexpected response. Any advice or any words that you could help us as palliative care providers to have better understanding of, of a patient's situation? Um, well, in my specific case, I did not know what I was getting into. Um, and it was very difficult to get information about how, what it's like to actually live trait invented. Um, and I think, I don't know how we could have gotten more information about that, but that's been a huge problem. That's been, a, it's been a shockingly difficult transition um, uh, to living with the trach. Uh, and I haven't made peace with it yet. I'm working on it. Um, okay. Um. And towards that end, you gave me, um, I asked for like a, a little biography, and you sent me back, and this was the title, A Condensed Biography of Julie Grimes, A Reluctant Palliative Care Graduate. <laughs> now I'm thinking, nudge, nudge. okay, I mean, of course, you're a reluctant patient because you don't want, you didn't want this unexpected illness. And then, you know, especially when you're in palliative care, you're thinking hospice, you're thinking, I certainly don't want that. But are you saying something else when you say uh, 
a reluctant palliative care graduate? Yeah, I think I was discharged from Snowline too soon. Um, the transition, as I was describing, was really, really difficult and painful, and it's taking a very long time to learn how to do it. And I've had to spend enormous, and my, me and my husband, spent enormous resources, time, energy, um, just trying to figure out what to do. It took, it took me six months to figure out who was in charge of the vent settings. And asking the doctors was futile. It was impossible. It took, um, and there's so many new doctors. There's the, there's the PM&R people. There's the otolaryngologist. There's the GP. There's the DME company. There's some, a bunch of other doctors in there somewhere, too. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah, respiratory therapists. Um, and I, I think we both needed a lot more, a lot more, a lot of support to get through that. If we had, what comes to mind is a case manager. I really needed a case manager. I needed someone to guide me through all of that, because not only was I recovering from a surgery, um, I'm still sick. I still have limited energy, limited energy, and um, I, I think if palliative care. If you can transition someone from out from hospice care to a more functional, uh, positive living experience, I think that transition needs to be taken seriously um, and given more weight. And I think that's a really important message for uh, all of us to hear because we oftentimes see palliative care as the prelude to hospice. But really, you know, when we talk about what our roots are, our roots are is how to make uh, a life better uh, at all stages of disease. And so this was a special case because we actually, in some ways, got someone better, but we could have paid maybe better attention to the burden that was still there. And I think that's something that, as we're developing our programs, we really need to stay aware of. Um, so, we're going to allow for a question or two, if uh, anyone has a question for Julie. <clears throat> so, Julie, um, I'm, I'm sure Julie is open to having you guys come talk to her at, at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've found is that I've heard now for years those stupid EMRs, you can't tell what the story is in the EMR. And so we all know that in order to provide care, we have to know the story. And what's really, I think, drives us here in this room is that we know this, is that when we can start helping patients write their story, that's why we all love our jobs and what we do. And so really thank you, Julie, for the opportunity for us to be able to participate you know, in your care. Um, I thank all of you for all that you are doing in your own uh, little neighborhoods. And we uh, hope that this session helps give you a little bit more insight. And thank you, Melissa. Ah, you want to say something else? I would like to thank my Snowline team, all of you. You did wonderful work for me. I'm a passionate advocate for palliative care, and ex I'd love to see palliative care expanded to include more diagnoses, earlier intervention in um, people who have uh, chronic illnesses of all kinds, MS, Parkinson's, um, Alzheimer's, you name it. Um, we all need people to help us. Who, we need experts, case managers, to help us manage a really difficult um, medical system and insurance scenario. Oh, dear God. Um, so I, I'm going to be a, an advocate for it, and any way I can help, I'm happy to. So thank you very much. It was a gift.
My name is Margo Vos, and I'm a certified hospice and palliative care nurse who worked out in the, in the community for many years doing case management. And you voiced something that I've been thinking about for a long time, which is that we have this role of what we call nurse navigators. And very often you see nurse navigators in oncology departments. But my daughter was recently diagnosed with a kind of unusual genetic condition that looks like we're going to be managing lifelong. And I have had to negotiate all the ologists uh, in the last year um, to try to find my way through that with her. And it occurred to me that this role of nurse navigators is one that we really need, as you just voiced so beautifully, in palliative care, in people who have chronic illnesses, and that we don't have to step away. Like, it's a shame to me that you were discharged from this wonderful service that you had, because yes, you're better, but you know, you probably are gonna need some navigation for the rest of your life. Yes. And so I would really like to advocate to all of the policy makers and program directors in this room to consider this idea of creating a role, and I think nurses fill that role really beautifully just because of our training. Uh, so that's, I just wanted to make that comment. Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. I agree. I want to echo, I'm Chris Kington Barker, and I'm from uh, San Luis Obispo County, and we are a social model hospice. One of the things that we noticed, because we work in tandem with medical hospices and with palliative care organizations, is there was a continuous situation for individuals in your circumstances who were being dropped when they no longer qualified for home health or palliative care. They weren't ready to move on to a hospice. Um, their case management would stop. Their decline wouldn't stop. Their dying wouldn't stop. Or their disease progression wouldn't stop. But the support would. We instituted a care management within our program about a year and a half ago. And we wow. hired a nurse. Uh, most recently, we started originally with somebody who was geriatric trained. We switched to an RN who um, has been magnificent she does care management for individuals telephonically and also does face-to-face -face care management. So she's care managing individuals, about 49 to 50 cases with just telephonic care management. And then she also is managing care, manage care um, for the cases that we have on in-home for our clients as well as just answering questions for people and directing. But it's not only just giving people a list. She's actually making the connections, making the phone calls, making the appointments, and getting them connected. Yes. You can't check a box and say, call these people. You actually yeah. have to do it. So kudos to you for oh, saying thank that. Thank you. My doctors actually give me homework to do that's impossible for me to accomplish. Exactly. Because yeah. the other doctors they want me to talk to aren't going to give right. me the information because I'm the patient. Well, and you they, make they multiple phone calls. They get to talk to each calls. other, and they yeah. don't. Yeah. They ask me to do it. Yeah. And, like, and when we're talking about caregivers or individuals who, are, who have a problem with a, a illness or a debility, or they cannot sit by the phone and wait to go through the telephone tree and call again and wait for the call back. So. Yes. So I think the so my, I, my plea is for other people to yeah. look at a way to make that happen because we're seeing it on a community-wide need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the overriding message is that the palliative care needs are great and, and we're nowhere close to being able to meet all those needs. So. Yeah, and there's a need community-based. So if palliative care is only offered in, in a hospital-based, it doesn't meet community. So join me in thanking our panelists again for the presentation.